to be joined in the downtown den this afternoon by the uh, MP for Wigan, Lisa Nandy, who also has a little job as Shadow Foreign Secretary uh, on Labour's front bench. Uh, great to see you, Lisa. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. I was just complaining beforehand that I was the first Shadow Foreign Secretary in history never to travel beyond my spare room in Wigan, but no, you never know. Things might start opening up again soon. And it's nice to be able to join you virtually, even if we can't do it in person. Yeah, absolutely. And as I say, we're really grateful that you've uh, taken some time out of your schedule to be with us. Listen, before we get on to the, uh, the new job and talk about, you know, the situation across the world, because there are some critical issues happening at this moment in time, not least the UK's new place in uh, the international community. Let's start at home. Um, I'm Wigan, Greater Manchester, the Northern Powerhouse, because um, I know that you were a keen um, contributor to the discussion and the debate about how de devolution should happen. Uh, obviously, we're four years in now to uh, that Devo Mag deal that was done. Andy's uh, the elected mayor. Uh, we're going to have an elected mayor in West Yorkshire from May. Um, obviously, Steve Rotherham situated in Liverpool. Uh, but I get the sense, I wonder whether this is something you share, that the appetite uh, for decentralisation and devolution is somewhat diminished within the current government. Is, is that something you're picking up or am I misreading the signals? I think so. I mean, it was very much, uh, you know, brainchild of George Osborne and he had a very deaf definite way of seeing devolution which led him to clash with me and with many others over the course of his tenure as chancellor but nevertheless he was very committed to the to the concept of trying to move power out of Whitehall and Westminster and it doesn't feel that that direction is really coming from any one individual or any one department now in government it's obviously been overtaken by this leveling up pledge that the Prime Minister made during the 2019 election and you know to be charitable to the government we, we've had a pandemic you know there are lots of reasons to understand why the government's attention would have been diverted elsewhere but my, my honest sense is that the levelling up agenda was very much about trying to find a way to reach um, communities like mine in Wigan to try to win votes in a general election. I think it hasn't translated into much more than that. I don't think there's ever been an understanding that if you want to level up parts of the country that have seen 40 years of economic decline, then you don't just build great big roads and concrete over everything you can see. You've got to level up the people in them. And that investment in people has not been part of that agenda. I think also there's not really any real recognition in government that what we want most of all in parts of the country like mine in the north of England, we want real power to make those decisions for ourselves. You know, I've said before that if we've been given the right to decide how transport spending was spent and we've been given our fair share of, of that funding, we wouldn't have started with High Speed 2. We wouldn't even probably have started um, with regional trains we probably would have started with buses because that is where most people are and that is the thing that really blights people's lives the loss of bus routes over the last 10 years and then of course you want to connect up the great towns and cities of the north it's a nonsense that it takes me longer you know it takes me twice as long to get to Newcastle as it does to get to London and so there are you know there are priorities that we have that we can see because we're very close to the coal face that the government will never be able to to understand and when you look at things like the towns funds this is just about a group of civil servants and politicians sitting in Whitehall kicking around whether Cheadle or Lee deserves a, a investment in their high street I mean to me that's a nonsense of the whole idea of devolution to be honest. Yeah, it does uh, take away, I thought, the, the credibility uh, of the devolved governments, because if they should be responsible for anything, then it's about distributing that new money, in my opinion. So, you know, I was disappointed to see that. And it, it also feels a little bit like going back to the 80s, where we had these beauty contests for regeneration pots of funding, and you had to tick particular boxes. Uh, and what happens then, Lisa, you'll be aware, is that, you know, local government officials and others uh, quite naturally 
bend what their project was going to be to suit the funding criteria. So you actually end up with the worst of both worlds. You end up spending a load of cash, but on the wrong things. Yeah, there's a there's a there's another problem that I think is coming down the line that that hasn't really been part of this debate but needs to be. The government is looking now to economic regeneration post COVID and trying to sort of rebuild the economy after what's been a, a you know dreadful year and a real shock to a lot of people. One of the ways that they're doing that is calling in local authority leaders and saying we need projects to invest in across the country they call them shovel ready projects projects that are ready to go where you can just sort of pump funding in and hope to see big bang for your buck you know a big return on productivity and see that translating into growth very very quickly so that the government can say that they've got the economy back on its feet the problem with that of course is that the places that are best placed to adapt and to do that where those shovel ready projects were already in the offing are often those places that have had investment in infrastructure over the last 40 years so what we've seen and you know part of the reason for these big seismic political shifts in recent years is that over the course of my lifetime the funding the investment has gone from places like Wigan, Bolton, Bury, the towns around Manchester, around Liverpool into the major cities now you know i'm not for a moment um arguing that there isn't great deprivation it's created huge inequality in those cities you know overheated housing markets people priced out of the market um you know and all the problems that ensues from that but what it's meant is that it the investment the infrastructure the foreign direct investment 40 years ago used to go into places like wigan it now goes into manchester so we are not well placed to benefit from these shovel ready projects what the government is doing and the strategy that they're pursuing at the moment will widen the existing inequalities and worsen the situation for areas that have already been left behind those areas will fall further and further behind as a deliberate as a as a direct consequence of the, the the actions and the strategy that the government is following and when i said i just don't feel that there is really much of a drive around this in government it's because i don't think there is any understanding that that is the problem i think they think that they can just commit to the same failed economic model that has piled investment into cities um, stripped it from surrounding towns and hoped that the benefits trickle out. That model has failed us for 40 years. They didn't. And it's time that we saw something different. Lisa, if I can just talk about Wigan for a moment, though. Uh, it's, uh, I was, you know, in Up Holland for many years. That's where I lived. And, and Wigan was a place I used to uh, hang out when I was a kid, would you believe? Because I went to John Rigby College in Oral. I did, yeah. It's amazing, John Rigby. That's great. Yeah. Great place. Uh, I'm not sure they were glad to have me, but I'm glad I went there. And and, and listen, um, you know, I, I've seen some great transformation of uh, Wigan Town Centre uh, in, in recent years. I think you know, the chief exec and the team there seem to be doing a really good job. Um, I, and I just wondered whether, despite the comments that you've just made there, and I take on board the points that you make, but as a town, actually, um, lots of opportunity and potential around Wigan. And, and as I say, I think, you know, some great regeneration projects that, that make the place look and feel a lot livelier these days than it was, say, 15, 20 years ago. Yeah, I think I think that's right. I think the council is is doing an amazing job. And, you know, I don't represent the council. I, I represent the people to the council. And at times I've had my moments with my own council over the last 11 years as they have with me. But the truth is that they are a very good council and they are very proactive about making sure that people can see uh, a borough that is on the up, that, you know, cares for itself and its community, that has a sense of pride about it. And they've always understood that when you, you know, if you get off the train at Wigan, at Wigan Northwestern and you look across the road and what you see is these grand old buildings, the former mining college, the first mining college um, in Europe, I believe, um, you know, you see these great old buildings in a state of decline. That is a really you know, toxic mix for a lot of people about a history that is very, very proud and a present potentially future 
that looks very, very difficult. And so they, they care about the area and they've invested in the area and they've invested in the people as well as the places, which is important. But the trouble is they're doing it against a tide of um, that is becoming more and more difficult to sustain. So if you walked down my high street 11 years ago, you would have seen, um, you know, sh shops, filling every unit now you'll see many empty units you'll see money lenders that weren't there 11 years ago at the bottom of the high street you'll see a lot more charity shops we've lost marks and spencers we've lost debenhams under the cover of covid this is getting worse so wh smith was in real trouble they were talking about pulling out the government closed our crown post office a few years ago they refused to step in to save it and moved it into WH Smith. So we were faced for the second time in two years with the loss of our Crown Post Office in the town centre. And they're consulting or have been consulting. I say consulting like that because it's not a consultation, it's an absolute sham. Uh, on removing our direct rail link to Manchester Piccadilly. That is where 60% of my constituents travel for work. Those are where the good, well-paid jobs are. They bring that money back into the borough and they spend it on the high street. The fact that the government is allowing this to happen just a few years after they told us that the Northern Powerhouse was going to see the greatest investment in rail um, and in our transport um, links that we'd ever seen is absolutely outrageous. And my worry is that what is going to happen is that people will come out of this very difficult year where you know they've either been working on the front line as key workers trying to keep this country going um, without a break or they've been at home observing the rules you know not seeing family doing what they're asked to do they're going to emerge from all of that and find that what is left in communities like ours that were told that they would be leveled up um, just a couple of years ago is 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 so much worse than what was there before and that's why i say that the government has got to take seriously the fact that You've got to invest in our areas. You've got to invest in good quality skilled jobs. You've got to invest in young people so that they can get those jobs and retraining for people who need it. You know, Wigan is a great place. It's a vibrant place. It should have a really, really strong future. The reason that, you know, we've got companies like Heinz here is because we have lots of open space. We have access to fresh water. We have a loyal, willing workforce. We have good transport links um, on the on the roads, if not if not on the trains and the buses because of a lack of investment. We need the government to do their bit now. The people do their bit. Business is doing their bit. But the people who aren't doing their bit are the government. Now, listen, before we go off the Northern Powerhouse agenda into your uh, current brief, let me ask you um, two things, actually, I need to ask you. So we'll stick with the Northern Powerhouse for a second and just uh, the uncomfortable report that came out from... Um, the government yesterday about Liverpool City Council uh, and the way in which certain things have been managed there. Um, you know, somebody whose headquarters are in the city, who's done a lot over the last uh, decade and a half, actually, uh, in Liverpool and seen huge improvements to uh, the fabric, the infrastructure uh, and the visitor economy in particular in the city. It did make uncomfortable reading. Um, but nonetheless, Lisa, I think, you know, the front bench of the Labour Party, uh, as with the government, have welcomed the report and have uh, backed the uh, decision to, to send in uh, government commissioners to actually help the council in the next stages of development and try and basically fix some of those problems that have been identified. Yeah, well, I mean, look, we don't welcome the situation in Liverpool at all. And like you said, Liverpool is an amazing city with huge amounts going for it. The transformation of Liverpool over the course of my ad adult lifetime has been incredible. You know, when I was growing up in Manchester in the 1980s, when you went into Manchester City Centre, just as when you went into Liverpool City Centre, it was a completely different place. And, you know, there's been lots of people who've been involved in that. Um, including local officials, local politicians, um, and the European Union as well, that put in huge amounts of money to try and regenerate northern cities when, frankly, the government wouldn't. So this, you know, it's been a huge effort, and I'm not taking anything away from that. But this is a really serious report. These are very, very serious allegations. You know, obviously, can't say very much about them. There's a legal process ongoing, and you know, a number of people have been arrested. But we take seriously the fact that, you know, public money has to be 
has to be you've got to be absolutely above board with the way in which you you conduct governance and we we're absolutely wedded to that and you know just note as well that in the report the the chief executive of the council was praised um you know and I, I want to reiterate that you know those people who've been you know pushing very hard for liverpool's regeneration and delivering you know those people deserve our thanks and they deserve our credit but we've got to take this seriously there's no there's no getting around the fact that these are very very serious allegations and that's why we said that we supported the government to send commissioners in to to get this right well, hopefully it's uh, still glass half full in Liverpool. Certainly there's still a confidence within the private sector here that things will um, begin to improve once we get the COVID crisis out of the way. And let me turn to that, Lisa, because the last big crisis, the last big crash uh, was in 2008, of course, and the, the, the banking crisis. And I was reflecting a couple of weeks ago in a conversation um, as to how uh, the the world leaders reacted to that crisis. And, you know, we all remember the pictures of Gordon Brown um, getting together with his G7, G8 colleagues, whatever it was at the time. And we had Gordon, we had uh, Barack Obama, we had Angela Merkel at the height of her powers. Um, it's some serious international leaders there. And, and certainly in terms of Gordon Brown, someone with a huge ability and a mind to, to get his head around the challenges that we faced at that time. And although it was a crisis that many suffered from, it, it didn't send us into catastrophe. And it really felt as though there was a cohesion, a coordination behind the plans that were taking place. And so we didn't feel out of step with the rest of the planet. Uh, at this moment in time, Lisa, I'm not laying this at Boris Johnson, the UK government's feet. But it does seem to me that there's a total disconnect between what's happening here, what's happening in the EU, what's happened in the States. I just wanted to get your thoughts around uh, that because, you know, from the outside looking in, it, it can be quite depressing, can't it? Yeah, I think that's fair. I think there was... Um the, the, response, the global response was very, very slow compared to other, you know, I'm not sure there is a comparable crisis to this, but other major global crises, that is certainly true. And there was a vacuum in which nobody really stepped forward to show global leadership. There were some countries that tried to do it on particular issues. You know, Macron um, pushed very hard for a global ceasefire in the early days that was unsuccessful. You had um, countries like Canada stepping up and trying to lead the way in getting global agreement around a vaccine. Um, but it was very, very slow, particularly two, two areas. One was about um, treatment, diagnostics and vaccines. So trying to get a global agreement about how we make sure that they uh, are developed together and reach as many people as possible, as quickly as possible around the world. And we still have problems with that, despite the United States now joining some of those efforts is a scheme called COVAX to try and get the vaccine out as, as widely as possible. There are, there's a big funding gap that remains. And this is a real problem for us because we've seen, you know, over in France, for example, in the last few weeks, real concern about the South African variant and whether that is potentially more resistant to the vaccine than other new strains. I don't want to alarm people, but you know, the scientists, we have briefings with SAGE scientists every few weeks, and they are absolutely clear that where you have very high infection rates, that's where you get new variants. And eventually one of those strains could be vaccine resistant, and then we've got a real problem again. So we've got to make sure that we do better than that. The other, the other area, of course, is economics and trying to stop economic hemorrhaging across the world. And I think if COVID has reminded us of anything, it's that we live in a very globally interdependent world. And the response there was extraordinarily slow. Um, we've seen a little bit of movement with countries, uh, developing countries being able to access what's called special drawing rights in the last um, few days. There's been a breakthrough around that to make sure that the, their economies don't fall over, which would then create a domino effect across the world. None of us want to see that. I guess, if I'm honest, there are a few reasons for, the, for this. One is the, the, the particular situation the United States was in yeah. at the time, um, you know, with President Trump 
and who'd taken a very isolationist approach over recent years, you didn't just see the US stepping out of that leadership role, but you also saw attacks on the World Health Organization and on those global agreements at the very moment when we most needed the world to come together. Um, the EU was particularly divided, struggling to reach an agreement about how to respond even within the European Union, let alone how to front that up to the world. I don't want to overstate that. They did resolve those difficulties and agree a bailout package within the EU that then allowed them to step into the global arena and, and work with other others to, to advance that. But that was problematic. But, you know, in terms of the U UK, I think what this crisis has shown is the folly of um, the government's approach over recent years. We've gained a reputation as an alliance breaker, not an alliance maker. And that is a real problem. You know, in the world that we live in, we need friends more than ever. And having needlessly trashed our friendships with many of our closest neighbours, we haven't invested heavily enough in trying to either rebuild those alliances and repair them or in trying to build alliances elsewhere. And I think you saw with COVID that that became a real problem. I think the government saw it as well, to be honest, but there's still a huge tension within government about how they want to, to proceed with that. I think, you know, when you look at Brexit, it, we, we had this ongoing endless row for four years about whether we should leave the European Union or not. The argument now really is about whether we want to make Brexit work. And the curious thing to me is that it feels like the Labour Party wants to make Brexit work and make Boris Johnson's deal work, work more than he does at the moment. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it, it's a very strange place to be, isn't it? I think, you know, as someone who is a staunch Remainer, um, you know, I, I'm not one of these people who think we should start campaigning to get back in the EU tomorrow. Uh, but nevertheless, I look at the deal that was agreed uh, and as bad as it was, I, I think it's been made worse by just some of the practical implications. I, I, yeah, implicate, uh, the way they've implemented it, sorry. Um, it's made it worse than it needed to be. Yeah. Uh, and and um, I mean, we'll, we'll talk about the states uh, a bit later on and the relationship with Joe Biden and the, the Irish situation perhaps, but I just want to stick with COVID for a second and, and perhaps look at this domestically and I'd be interested to get your view here Lisa because you know we have had a government that has had a bounce because it's successfully rolled out the vaccination and I get that and we welcome that you know we all want at this moment in time our government to be successful because you know no matter what your politics are the last thing you want is in four or five years time to be potentially taken over a, a country that's in the gutter because we just haven't been able to manage this crisis. But prior to the vaccination rollout, um, you know, to use a technical term, it, it was a shit fest and there was nothing that was going right. Um, you know, and, and that can go from, you know, where I sit in terms of seeing business support and businesses falling over, the hospitality sector feeling as though it was being abandoned right through um, to individuals who are telling to, to, being told to self-isolate but are not being supported to do so. That then makes me a little surprised that the Labour Party are happy to sign up for, and I might be wrong with this, I'm reading, are happy to sign up for a further six-month extension to lockdown regulations. So as I say, you might tell me that I'm wrong on that. Um, but, you know, I'm worried about civil liberties at the moment, I think, for, for all sorts of reasons. And I would have anticipated that we'd at least be bringing the government and the executive back every month to justify why those restrictions are staying in place. So tell me what the thinking is around that. So the vote this week has two things rolled up in it. So the first is about some of the measures that were in place during the lockdown. So it renews the, the legislation basically that allowed for the lockdown, but also puts in place things like statutory sick pay, which we fought very hard for, um, and a uh, ban on evictions during the, the lockdown period and, and, and other measures like that. So there's, a, there's, a, there's that renewal of the, that legislation that we're debating in a very short amount of time that the government has allowed and then voting on this week. But rolled up in that as well is another vote, which is same vote, but another package of measures, which enables us to unlock over the next few months. 
and we're very keen to see the economy unlocked we want to do it gradually we want to do it safely we want to be guided by the science but we do want to see the economy unlock and we want this to be the last lockdown and so the government is offering no amendments no um changes to that legislation they're offering a few hours of debate and um then a straight yes or no vote on that and that, that's why we've said that we won't stand in the way of that legislation going through because without that legislation we could be in a great deal of trouble indeed and take away some of the safeguards that currently are the only things that are keeping people afloat i'm afraid this is the consequence of having fought an election um, and lost our entire Labour base in every nation and region of the UK and seen a government returned with an 80 seat majority is that we don't have leverage to try and change that. So what we've got is a, it, it's, it's, sorry to get so technical, but we've got what's known as a sort of reasoned amendment where we're making clear the fact that there are things in this legislation that we are uncomfortable with or opposed to there are fairly sweeping powers for example around um uh, around people being able to be arrested on who are suspected of having covid um and those powers there is reason to believe that those powers have been used in a way that has been um uh, you know beyond what we would think would be acceptable over the last um um, few months since they came into force and so we want to we want to know from the government what safeguards they'll put in place around that um, what transparency they'll put in place around that we want them to report back to parliament when those powers are used so that we can scrutinize those and challenge them if necessary but we're absolutely not in the same camp as some of the Tory rebels who are basically just saying just unlock and let the virus rip through the population that is the surefire way that you'll get um you know more deaths more pain for families but also more economic pain as well because we would have to go back into lockdown and none of us want to see that again so that's the the, the distinction just let me be clear here lisa is that it's an all or nothing sort of deal that's being offered yeah yeah so it's um do we have any regulations or do we not and do we have the support measures in place as well or do we not and you know on balance given the, that choice i mean politics is about difficult choices in the end you've got to deal with the, the world as it is not the world as you would like to be we're not in government we don't have the choice to amend this legislation so we won't stand in the way of it going through because without it a lot of people in this country would really really be struggling okay right back to the day job then and the uh, foreign secretary role i just wanted to i don't want to relive the the, the brexit debate the point oh, no thank you uh, neither do i yeah, no only to, only to say that that uh, not very often i say this lisa but you were right and i was wrong because i remember that you were one of the labor mps who were um urging support for one of theresa may's deals, I forget which one, because there were that many coming to the, the Commons at the time. And I think when you look back now, um, that would have been a far better place for us to be than the deal we ended up with. But as I say, no point reliving that. Uh, just wondered what you now see, because it was interesting, you know, you, you, you might be in your back bedroom in Wigan, but you're still talking to uh, world leaders across the globe. So what sense do you get in terms of what their view of the UK in 2021 is. Do you, do you think our international reputation has uh, sort of stabilised? Uh, do you think the vaccination rollout, for example, and the success of that has improved uh, that reputation? Or do you think people are looking at us a, a little bit concerned about what the UK stands for these days? I think there's a lot of confusion about what the UK is doing. Um, people are a little bit baffled about it. I think there was um, there have been a few moments over the last um, few years where people really haven't understood what it is that the UK is trying to do at all. I mean, you know, what one example is when Boris Johnson decided to threaten the EU with unilaterally tearing up yes. the withdrawal agreement, you know, an international agreement that we'd negotiated that only a few months before he waved in front of the House of Commons and said, this is a great triumph, this is a victory for us. And then suddenly a few months later decided it was the worst thing he'd ever seen, despite having negotiated it himself and threatened to tear it up. That, that had ripple effects way beyond the European Union. World leaders, sister parties, 
right across the the globe have raised with me questions about what what that's about i think that you know one of the biggest problems with that is that for particularly for the united states the special relationship has always been based on both the us and the uk being reliable trusted partners and over the last few years with president trump and with the current prime minister that we have in in downing street that has really been called into question and that is a problem for the uk because you know if we if we don't see our future you know the government doesn't see our future as lying with europe then it's got to lie somewhere traditionally we've exerted influence through three spheres in the world one is the commonwealth one is the us and one is europe and at the moment it's not at all clear where the government sees us exerting that influence out in the world again now i do think president biden could be a game changer for us but it crucially depends on what we do next and at the moment, there's just this enormous confusion within government about what we want to do. You know, on the one hand, for example, you hear very, very tough talk coming out of the Foreign Office about the role of China, the way in which China is undermining and abusing human rights for the Uyghur, it, democratic freedoms in Hong Kong. And yet at the same time, you've got other government departments, the Business Department, the Department of Culture, Media and Sport, who have been... Uh, you know, dragged kicking and screaming to end Huawei's role, a Chinese-backed company in um, in 5G, one of our critical national infrastructures, and a business department that is still considering handing over large chunks of our nuclear power industry and our energy security to a Chinese-backed firm. I mean, the, I think for a lot of people watching Britain at the moment, there's a there's a really strong desire to see a, a country that is prepared to go out and show a leadership role on the world stage again, that is prepared to be a reliable and dependable ally. They want to work with us. That's the good news. The bad news is they just don't understand at all what this government is doing. And that, that is a problem for us. Maybe they don't know yet. Let's see. <laughs> well, I think, I think the government doesn't know yet. I think that's the real problem. You know, I always felt that that was the problem with Brexit is yeah. that we couldn't get onto negotiating with the European Union because after three years, this cabinet, you know, under Theresa May was still negotiating with itself. And that was the problem. And I feel, I think that, you know, the integrated review, this global policy, Britain policy that Boris Johnson released last week, really highlights those tensions and contradictions. It really shows them, throws them into stark relief until the government knows what sort of role it wants to play in the world, what sort of values it wants that to be based on and where we're going to find friends and alliances in order to advance those values. It's going to really seriously limit our effectiveness. And there is a real risk at the moment that with a new administration in the White House and uh, you know, renewed sense of urgency around some of these global problems in the European Union, that what you'll see more of is what we saw a few weeks ago, where you had John Kerry coming over to Europe to meet with European leaders to determine the agenda for the world's biggest climate conference, of which we're the hosts in a few months' time, and we weren't even in the room. And that that is the problem, and that will be a problem for business, a really big problem for business. And that's that's what we've got to solve. And that's why when I say we've got to stop needlessly trashing those relationships. You know, stop using things like the Good Friday Agreement as a bargaining chip. Ireland has always been a close and important partner for the United Kingdom. We've got to start repairing those relationships in Europe and in the United States so that we can advance our interests abroad and deliver for people at home. And, and you just sort of segue nicely into my next question, really, in terms of the Irish question. But, you know, again, there is increasingly a sense that the United Kingdom itself it is under strain and we've seen you know despite its recent local difficulties the, the Scottish National Party still continue to uh, poll well at least uh, and it looks as if they're going to try and force a second referendum we then have uh, all the problems that we talked about briefly earlier in terms of Brexit deal and the border in Ireland um, it, you know so our international reputation People might be looking and thinking, well, I wonder what the UK stands for these days. But just within the United Kingdom itself, it seems to be fracturing. And again, you know, the, the party, Labour Party, um, you know, at one time, Scotland was, was a bastion of red wall seats. Never mind what we lost in the north of England in 2000, 
uh, and 19. So how can the opposition react to these seismic changes that are taking place within, as I say, Great Britain itself? Well, I mean, I suppose the first thing to say is that Scotland was very much a precursor of what we started to see later in England and to, to some extent in Wales as well. It's partly why I came to the view that I did quite quickly about, about um, our membership of the EU after the referendum. I was a Remainer as well. I campaigned really hard for Remain. I think I put in more mileage than almost any other member of the shadow cabinet during the during the EU referendum. And I, I spent most of it in the northeast, the northwest, in parts of the country where we, you know, that had consistently returned Labour MPs for a hundred years, but where people really took a completely different view to us around Brexit. And I recognised what I was seeing from the independence referendum that we'd had a few years earlier in Scotland, where it had very much become a, a sort of cultural um, clash in a way. It was it became a question of whether we understood that people, when people were saying the system isn't working for us, you're not delivering, that you haven't delivered for our areas. You know, places that have seen 40 years of economic decline did not react well to a Labour politician turning up and essentially saying you've never had it so good. And yeah there was you know it felt to me actually that once we'd had the referendum that we were fighting the last battle still and we needed to look to the next one which was can we forge a close relationship with Europe that will continue to protect jobs in those areas you know I went to the Nissan factory in Sunderland during the referendum and that was one of the moments that really changed my mind because you know essentially I was saying to people you're gonna these jobs are gonna go this is gonna be a problem it's an economic argument and they were saying we know but look around you and look what we've seen over the last 40 years yes we've got these good jobs but what else have we got you've allowed all that to be stripped away from us and this is our moment where we say to you enough is enough and we're going to vote for this anyway to get you to wake up and listen so for me, there's a, a big, a deeper question that we've got to understand in the Labour movement, which is that there was so much bound up in that Brexit vote and there was so much bound up in what happened in 2019. And we have to actually start delivering on the things that matter most to people in their own lives. And we've got to do that in Scotland, as well as in Wales, actually, where, you know, people often say in the Welsh Valleys that Cardiff feels as remote as Westminster, just as they say in towns across Scotland that Holyrood feels as remote as Westminster. And we've got to show that we can deliver for people in those areas and for their communities and on the things that most matter to them. Let me give you one example of how we've tried to do that recently, and then I'll, I'll shut up. But um, we recently, Keir, Starmer went to do a virtual um, roundtable with the Scotch whisky producers in Scotland. This is a crown jewel industry for the United Kingdom. It could not matter more. And yet when President Trump was in office, he slapped huge tariffs on the Scotch whisky industry, which have had a really devastating effect on that industry, on people's jobs and on people's communities. That is something we take really, really seriously in the Labour Party. When we met with the Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, when we met with Woody Johnson, the ambassador, it was the first thing that we raised. And what we've got to demonstrate as a Labour movement is that we, you know, A, that there is a realistic prospect of us taking power at Westminster in order to be able to deliver on these things, but B, that we will deliver on these things, that for people in Scotland, being part of the United Kingdom is not about having to make compromises, it's about having more clout more ability to go out into the world and advance their own interests you know I suppose you know the the sort of the old adage that we are stronger together but we've got to demonstrate to people that that is true and we understand that there's a humility about the way in which we approach it now that perhaps we haven't had previously and we're absolutely determined to go out and make the case whatever happens I believe in the United Kingdom and I'm going to go out and fight for it. And a question from me, Lisa, and um, we, we've asked people if they want to come into the chat room to put some questions to you. We'll try and get them on the screen. I know Jim Hancock's watching with interest this afternoon, and thanks to Jim for helping facilitate today's uh, Downtown Den conversation. But as I say, last question from me, you've mentioned uh, Joe Bad on a couple of occasions, and I think it be of interest to you, obviously, in terms of being Shadow Foreign Secretary, our relationship with the state is hugely important. Um, 
he has totally changed the direction of his country in the way in which uh, COVID has been tackled. He's put together a huge economic package of $1.9 trillion um, to prop up the economy and support people in the States. Um, but then the Democratic Party, uh, I think, in the challenges um, to Labour uh, in terms of its election against a very populist leader. You know, we people like you and I, Lisa, might look at Donald Trump and think he's an absolute lunatic, but he still managed to get over 70 million votes, even when he lost uh, the election last year. So two things, really. Um, how you think the UK can position itself so that it does continue to have that special relationship with a Biden presidency, and what you think Labour can learn potentially from the Democrats' success in the presidential election? Um, well, we, we work closely with the Democrats, as you imagine, they're our sister party, so we've had a, a good relationship with them for a long time. And we've spent quite a bit of time over the last few months talking to members of the Biden campaign team and also the incoming administration about what we can learn. The United States is not the United Kingdom. You know, there are there are big differences, not least our electoral system. You know, when they say we shifted the dial by 1% in Pennsylvania and that pushed us over the line, it doesn't help us here in the United Kingdom. You know, we don't need to shift the dial by 1% in in um in Lee, we need to shift the dial by, you know, whatever it takes to win the actual seat. So there's, you know, there's a different, there's a different sort of context, but nevertheless, there are striking similarities. And I think, you know, the thing that I find most interesting about the Biden team is not that they, they got on the front foot about this very early, that that's important. They, they started this campaign in 2016, the day that Hillary Clinton lost to Donald Trump. It's more that they are under no illusions about how difficult it is. And they said that they took a deliberate decision that they had to be present in every single community for all year round, not just during election times, in order to show that they weren't just there, but that they were delivering for people. And, you know, I said a lot in the Labour leadership contest about how Labour had become very hollowed out, that, you know, there are parts of the country where you just hadn't really seen us at all. And that's not a criticism of any of the Labour members in those areas but the National Party just didn't understand the importance of devolving resources and power to Labour movements in those areas now you know we say we want to devolve power to people across the country we've got to show that we mean it in our own movement first and we've got to be there for people all year round so there are some really interesting parallels for us and particularly that you know if you look at somewhere like I'm just actually I've got this just, I'm writing a speech at the moment. I was just looking up a, a line in this book, Hillbilly Elegy, which is a, a book by a guy called J.D. Vance over in the United States about growing up in Jackson, Kentucky. And the story that he tells about 40 years of economic decline, about you know, a town that was once proud, that had good skilled jobs, that has seen a lot of those jobs offshored and sent overseas, has seen not with that go the loss of pride, loss of purpose, and also the young people and the working age population that sustain the high streets, the bus networks. You know, that could have been written about mo many towns in this country. My own town, Wigan, has fared slightly better, partly because of good local leadership, partly because of proximity to Manchester. But we have seen that picture unfolding over the last 40 years here as well. And... I think there's a there's no there's no sense that I get from the Biden team that they're underestimating the challenge that it'll be to turn that around. And you're right, they rejoined the Paris Agreement, they rejoined the World Health Organization, they're getting a grip on COVID, they've got a big fiscal stimulus in place, but they don't believe that that is enough in the end to deal with these populist leaders that have emerged and they they very much see Boris Johnson in the mould of of that to deal with that, you know, people who come along stoking division and offering cheap solutions to complex problems, you've got to deal with those complex problems yourselves and you've got to deliver for people on the things that most matter to them. You know, in, in a, for me, the, the mark of success of a, of a Labour government will be, you know, can young people in places like Wigan who want to stay and some will want to leave and go and get opportunities elsewhere but do they have those opportunities here to be able to stay and not to have to choose between love home and family and work the future and opportunity 
And when that is real, when they get that choice, that real choice, and they have the power to decide themselves, that's when I'll feel my work is done and I'll go and retire somewhere with a big glass of, um, I don't know, pint of, pint of lager actually at the moment. I'm missing the pub. <laughs> yeah, I think we all are, aren't we? Um, so you, you mentioned though, you know, the challenge that the Democrats have with a populist leader. We, of course, um, may be perceived as having a populist leader in Boris Johnson. Uh, can he forge a positive relationship with Joe Biden, do you think? Yeah, I, I, I think they're, they're fair minded, the Biden administration. I think I don't know Joe Biden, but, you know, I've met and worked with many members of his incoming administration, some of whom we knew before because they they were they worked under the um, Obama administration as well. And um, they, you know, Biden is is pro Britain. Um, he's, you know, much was made of the fact that he he made those comments about the Good Friday Agreement and Britain's role in it. But he is pro-Irish, but he's also pro-Britain um, and he wants to have a good relationship with us. He's incredibly pragmatic as well. And I don't think there's any sense that the Biden administration is not interested in having a good, strong relationship with the United Kingdom. But um, but it depends what we do next. And there is a level of uh Still anger, I suppose, still about some of the actions that Boris Johnson's taken in recent years. The the comments about Barack Obama still run very deep, where he talked about Obama having this part Kenyan ancestry that were just deeply offensive, and st I still felt very strongly amongst some some of the the Democrats. And you know, I think there's work to do, frankly, in showing that we can be a reliable, dependable partner. And what was really baffling was that a few months ago, the Prime Minister did this great sort of you know Green New Deal moment where he said we were going to go out and show leadership on that. We were going to invest in defence. And then straight off the back of that, he cut our aid spending, and he has now cut the armed forces. And those two those things taken together just show. A government that is all over the place in terms of you know who we are what we're about the role that we play in the world and send a signal to other countries that we may not be the reliable de dependable partner that we once were that is a real problem i think the government really does need to quite urgently get its act together the, the door is open frankly that's the very strong sense i get from the Biden administration and from others around the world the door is open but they're looking at us with absolute confusion at the moment about what it is that we're about I'm not going to end on a negative note, Lisa. Uh, so tell me um, a walk uh, down to Wigan Pier or the other particular routes that you take when you escape from your back bedroom and you get out into the uh, the wide world of Wigan. Well, I've, um, I've taken up running in quite a big way. And one thing people don't realise about Wigan is it's a rural area, right? So we've got Wigan Town Centre and we've got, you know, lots of uh, former pit villages in the area but we've got the most incredible open countryside so if people are thinking about a day out in Wigan I guess I'd start with Hay Hall say come yeah. come and have a look see what we've got to offer it is don't believe what you read in the road to Wigan Pier it is the most incredible place and you know if I've got one mission I've been the MP for Wigan now for nearly 11 years and I stood for Parliament because of frustration. I think it's fair to say I'm even more frustrated now than I, than I was then. But I am absolutely determined that the world is going to know what an amazing place Wigan is and that our position, you know, not just ours, but towns like ours, our position, you know, at the heart of this country, contributing to, driving forward the, the country, its wealth, its influence, its, its purpose, that is going to be restored to places like ours. That is my mission and I'm going to achieve it. I'm sure, well, I, I certainly wouldn't argue with that. And it is a cracking place. So if you've not visited Wigan or you've not been for some time, I can highly recommend it. Jim Hancock does want to ask a question. Can we bring Jim onto the screen, Patrick? It's not the BBC, Jim. You do have to take yourself off mute. Mm -hmm. And on, yes, vision and unmuting. Right. OK. Um, well, thank you very much indeed, Lisa, for this. This has been absolutely excellent. Sorry about my hair. It's suffering from. I mean, I don't usually have hair problems, but it's a bit. 
the intention of a barber. Um, I, 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 I just wanted a bit further reflection. You've touched on this, but I do think there's a quite a struggle going on between populism and um, centre-left uh, politics. I think this is a huge challenge. I mean, I don't put them all in the same bracket, but you know, you did have that trio of Trump, Johnson, and Bolsonaro in Brazil. I mean, he's a he's a piece of work. I mean, uh, his attitude to the uh, pandemic is absolutely horrific. I mean, I don't think I'm exaggerating to say that he regards the death toll in Brazil as, a, as expendable. And he's just always constantly, you know, open up this, open up that, um, and his attitude to the rainforest and so on. So you, he's probably at the extreme end along with Trump. Um, but there are elements of that populism with, with Boris Johnson. But my question to you is, you know, it, it really is a challenge for the centre-left. I mean, Macron, uh, we repose quite a lot of hopes in him, but I think he's uh, not, not necessarily done the centre uh, or that alternative view a great, a great, a great favour. So I think the battle is, is very much very much on. And even in the European Union, which I, I, I think we all share our... I love for it and our sorrow at what's what's actually happened with our relations with it. But within the European Union, you know, Hungary, Poland, there are elements there which are really worrying. So this is this is a, a major struggle, not just for the British Labour Party. Uh, I think you know it's a real real uphill struggle for all people who, whether on the centre left or the centre right, want that sort of world and see the huge dangers in um, in in going going for going for populism. An easy one to end with, Lisa. I know. Thanks, Jim. Um, well, I mean, I guess the first thing I would say is that, um, you know, the, that trio that you talked about, Trump, Bolsonaro, Johnson, are mentioned in a recent report authored, led by Helen Clark, the former Prime Minister of New Zealand. They've been looking across countries at how COVID has been handled and singled out Brazil, the United States and the United Kingdom for particularly poor outcomes. You know, in, in the UK, we've had one of the worst death tolls in the world and we've had the worst outcome of any major economy. And there's a reason for that. And I think, you know, it's important that the lessons from that are learned. Um, and I think it's important that we understand how that has happened because actually one of the early lessons for me from this, from this, um, from this pandemic is that careful, patient, um, emotive leadership matters. And, you know, when you ask anybody in the British public, weirdly, the two names that come up when you ask who's shown good leadership during this crisis over and over again in surveys are Jacinda Ardern and Angela Merkel, two very politicians on very different parts of the political spectrum, but nevertheless have shown a different sort of leadership. And I think perhaps what that shows you is that the public is open to and looking for a different sort of leadership than the leadership that we've had on offer. And one of the lessons from the Biden team for us was that in the end, especially with everything that's happened in recent years, there is a ceiling on the amount of disruption that people are prepared to tolerate. And when I look at this current incarnation of the Tory party, I'm sorry to get all political in the final minute, but you know, even compared to the Theresa May government, the David Cameron government, it feels to me that their only trick in the book is to stoke division and disruption. You know, look at what they've been doing this week. We've had more rows about statues. I mean, who in this country is talking about statues except Boris Johnson? We've had this revival of these plans to set up wave machines to keep out asylum seekers and, you know, that nobody in this country is concerned about people are thinking about whether their business is going to survive, whether their kids are going to get their GCSEs this summer. You know, this is, and I, I think people are tired of it. So the, the challenge for us um, is perhaps not quite as great as you, you know, in terms of, you know, people, people being open to something new, but the challenge for us is to step in and show, you know, in the same way as, you know, you might win the war, but you've got to win the peace. And what comes next has got to be better than this. And we've got to win that argument with people. Keir started to do it a couple of weeks ago. You'll see a bit from, more from me about that next week when I speak to Chatham House about the role that we might play in the world and how that will deliver for people at home. And you will see a lot more from that, the Labour Party. That's our challenge. We're going to rise to it. Thank you. Lisa, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, great to see you keeping upbeat despite all the challenges, both politically and personally, I'm sure. 
Um, people do forget politicians are locked down as well. So, uh, no, great to see you. Uh, and we do want to get you to a live event as soon as we can. But uh, in the meantime, thanks to Lisa and Andy, foreign, uh, I was going to say foreign secretary, hopefully future foreign secretary. But it probably is. I've got it in my sights. <laughs> Pat Dale, foreign secretary, MP for Wigan. Uh, and she's been having a frank conversation in the downtown end today. See you again soon, Lisa. See you. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Bye. Bye. If you enjoyed that video, then please subscribe to our YouTube channel on the link below and be among the first to get to listen to all the latest interviews through the Downtown Den.